What we feed our pets is so important. It's why we talk about it so much because it literally is the foundation of everything else we do for our pets. It is the foundation of their health, which is the foundation of their happiness, of their quality of life. And that is why I'm so excited for today's guest. If you're not familiar with Roxanne Stone, you certainly know some of the projects she has worked on in the pet food industry, most recently with Solutions Pet Products. She is an innovator. She is one of the best formulators for pet food we have today. And that's not me saying that. If you remember back to a live that I did with BC Henshin, I also posted it um, on all the podcast apps as well. He said that she, that Roxanne is the best pet food formulator of our generation. And that's impressive. I can think of maybe three or four people that I would give that title to <laughs> as the best. And I do include Roxanne in that uh, because she is so passionate, so innovative, and so revolutionary and what she's doing. So today we're going to be talking to Roxanne Stone, who is currently working with Solutions Pet Products. And I'm so excited to have her on, to have her explain so many different things to you about pet food, about the pet food industry, about formulating, about fermentation, one of my favorite topics. So Let's get into today's episode with Roxanne. I just want to briefly, for those of you who are new here, thank you so much for being here. My name is Jessica. I'm your host. I'm also a certified canine nutritionist and certified holistic pet health coach, as well as a positive reinforcement dog trainer. So on this channel, we talk about everything, health, behavior, nutrition, all the things to make sure your dog or cat is living their best life life. So without any more further ado, let's get into today's episode with the one and only Roxanne Stone. Roxanne, thank you so much for joining me today. I am thrilled that you are here. I'm like just gushing behind the scenes that you are able to join us and provide some knowledge and information to the listeners because, oh boy, I'm... Like I said, I'm just like, ah, I'm so excited that you're here. So can you, for those people who may not be familiar with you yet or your work, which they may be more familiar with your work and just don't know the name behind it, would you mind um, just giving us a brief rundown of like who you are, what you do, what you've done, how people might know you? Sure. First, thanks for having me on on your podcast today. I'm Super excited to be here and get to know you better, Jessica. Um, yeah, I am currently the um, Nutrition Education Director for Solutions Pet Products. They are a small raw food, uh, raw pet food company uh, based out of Littleton, Colorado. And I got my start, I guess you could say, that in the pet food industry back in 2009. So my background is in... Um, Human nutrition and food sciences. That's that's what my degree and then um my big graduate work at Utah State University, um, making cheese. <laughs> so my uh, graduate work was funded by the um pizza the cheese pizza industry, actually. So uh, mozzarella. Uh so I always had a fascination with uh food and manufacturing of food and, and sort of the chemistry behind it and that uh helped me to go into um, my field of study. So I actually like um, try to be a bit brief. My husband came down with cancer in 2003, 2004, and I was working at Jack in the Box at the time in research and development in San Diego and um, was sort of disenfranchised a little bit with the the, the conventional uh, pet food, or, or sorry, the conventional food industry, and looking to, uh, with the husband of Paul being sick, looking to just eat better, do better, looking more into organics, 
wanted to, to dive into more uh, food as medicine. So I left Jack in the Box at, at that point, and we moved back to Utah, where my um, husband's from, where I went to school. And I started my own uh, consulting business at that time. I went into uh, food consulting, uh, and, and I started uh, just my own uh, independent operation. And, you know, had different jobs here and there. And then... Um, we moved out to Orton, and it wasn't long after that that my sister Jacqueline called me, and she said, hey, Mom reminded me that you're a food scientist. <laughs> I paid you nothing. That's how the conversation started. And she, I was like, oh, okay, yes, I am. And she said, um, how do you feel about pet food? And I you know, was honest with her. I said, well, I never worked in pet food, but you know, I work in manufacturing and, and food and food is food. And um, I think it's really interesting. And, and you know, we talked about pet food in the past a little bit because like, she actually got her start with Nature's Variety. Uh, Jacqueline, was always, Jacqueline and I had both found um, incredible love for animals all of our lives. And I always looked up to my big sister, Jacqueline. She was, uh, she was always blazing a trail in the animal world. So she went to school for um, pre-vet. And, um, but had got married and had kids before she finished that. So she was a vet tech for 16 years and she was introduced to raw pet food feeding pretty early on working for some innovative and holistic vets. And she was the one that actually introduced me to raw milk. And, um, cause I came out pretty conventional from school, you know, better eating through chemistry and, you know, how do we do this? How do we get more shelf lives? How do we, you know, how do we make it cheaper? How do we put more water in it? Those types of things. Not, you know, what is it? How we drizzle and dense is it? Or, you know, how is it contributing to our health? Um, that that was way at the bottom of the list on most of the projects that I worked on. So, um, like I said, so with my husband having cancer and, you know, he got into full remission and is doing great, but that prompts you to look a little bit further into your own health, your, the health of your family, what you're eating. And um, so we went down that road. And so it was very serendipitous when Jacqueline called because, um, like I said, we had started that journey already. And um, she says, yeah, I, I think I want to start my own pet food company. And, I'm, and I, need a, I need a food scientist. I need somebody who can do you know, quality control and... and um, purchasing and helped me set this up so it intrigued me and then um we started working together and it just we we didn't realize we're, we were eight years apart and so you know we kind of grew up with a little bit of a generation gap and when we put our heads together um everything just kind of exploded like we were like wow you know this we just kind of talked at each other to really look into the science the research and we fed off of each other very well. And so with our, the two, two of our heads together, we came up with some great ideas for pet food and, and introducing different pet foods uh, to the industry. So Ailsa's Cat Food was born in late 2009, or early 2010, and was the first to introduce basically uh, fermented pet food. And that was... Um, you know that that was something that that we evolved into, and uh, I think is is you know, we're really great. Unfortunately, um, due to circumstances out of our control, Jacqueline and I have had to leave uh, Answers, and then we helped uh, the campers who produced a lot of the food, a lot of the goat milk, uh, help them put together pure cut food. And uh, unfortunately, that was sidelined through some legal difficulties, and um, so it didn't last very long. So to the rescue, I guess, or just uh, Chelsea, Chelsea and, and her team uh, put together solutions, pet products, and, and wanted to make sure um, the products that worked so well for her and her clients uh, were... Um, something that she still had access to. So she basically developed her own pet food company. And then um, she she hired us and, and hi hired me. And unfortunately, um, Jacqueline passed away in September of 2022, um, or she'd be here with me today. And so, and I hope it's okay, Jessica, if I 
take this opportunity on on your platform just as a side note um talking about Jacqueline I I just want to state for the record on uh on your show today that uh Jacqueline did not commit suicide uh there was some rumors that she may have were uh in the field and I just wanted yeah. to clear up that confusion and any misinformation that people may have received that uh, she did not. She actually died due to complications from COVID. Yeah. I'm, so, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm just. I'm. I was so sorry to hear that, and I obviously didn't know either of you at that time, and um, so I, I, you know, wasn't involved in anything. But I, I, you know, I just her impact in the world. Um, I'm sure you're aware of it, but it, I'm sure, it, it, you know, it's always nice to get those reminders that she really it did is. have it a is. big ripple effect throughout the yeah, world. And I, and, I would like to take the opportunity as well to thank the entire Girl Pet Food community and, and feeding community because um, we, we got so much outpouring from everyone um, uh, uh, stating their individual uh connections to Jacqueline and, and how they knew her and how she helped with their dog and helped introduce them to raw pet food and or introduce them to raw milk and um that that was that was so wonderful to hear all that and so supporting so thank you to the raw pet food community who's listening um from me and my family uh that that was uh amazing um the and degree of support that we got and still continue to get to this day so um, yeah, so our our that launched me into the pet food industry, kind of from the human food industry, and um, was able to learn a lot. I early on and started attending the AFTO meetings, and that's eye opening <laughs> to say the least. Um, because the, I have to say, the pet food industry operates very differently from the human food industry on many levels, and and. One of those I'll point out is that uh, a lot of people don't realize that pet food manufacturers have to register their pet food in each state that they sell pet food in. Uh, very different from human food. You don't have to go through those uh, those provisions for, for getting your human food on the market. And as a result of that, it's sometimes difficult. But I know that we'll probably talk about that. I might get us from how I got started in pet food, but um, so that that's my sister drug me into this, and and um, I appreciate her for it because it's been uh, extremely satisfying, and she, um, her passion was contagious, and she definitely um, gave me the passion for this, for not only for pets and her companion animals, but for. Uh, learning about farming and regenerative farming and bringing that to the table as well. Yes, um, it is such a big deal. And like I said, she, she, there is such a ripple effect from, from her and you as well. Um, and I, I do also want to say that I'm really happy to hear that your husband is in remission. That's, you know, obviously devastating news that nobody wants. Um, but, you know, we always look back and I think, can real if if we can look back and see that things happen for a reason and leads us down these paths like um th there's like some solace in that and um so yeah it sounds like you can kind of see that progression <laughs> um, so with solutions and chelsea um the uh, first first off i want to say that i was recently uh, speaking with BC Henshin, and he said something to me that I want you to know in case you don't already know it. He okay. said that um, you are probably the best pet food formulator of our generation. And wow. uh, um, I just, <laughs> so uh, then again, and of course he says that and I'm like, oh, more pressure. <laughs> Well, yeah. she's a dear friend, and we uh, attended many of the AFCO meetings together. I got to know him and his wife, Kathy, um, incredible pioneers in, in the pet food industry themselves. Um, you know, it was sad to see that they, um, when they, they didn't retire from their store, but I know they're still very much involved. Um, I, I think he's 
BC might be doing a farmcast as well. And um, yeah, so it's, that's very lovely of him to say and, and so appreciate it. Right. I, I really do um, consider him a very dear friend and um, definitely has uh, with what he, uh, the articles he wrote for um, the pet food magazine he wrote for um, just contributed a lot he, and still does. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I bring that up because, you know, the way we see my generation, probably your generation, um, we're not that far apart in age, I don't think, but um, like the way pretty much all of society right now, at least, you know, in our in developed countries, see pet food, um, you know, we have been marketed to for so many decades that many people, most people, and even me, you know, 15 years ago, I was very much under this, you know, whatever is in this bag or this can, if I don't feed this, then I'm going to be killing my pet. Like, this is exactly what my pet needs. And um, so to have people that we call pioneers that are, you know, pet food formulators, we can look to, to who are making change in the pet food industry. Um, you know, more and more people, I think every day are just waking up to the idea that, oh, what's on the shelf in the grocery store isn't what isn't necessarily the best thing I could be feeding my pet. And so to have people like you who are kind of pushing the boundaries of what it means to feed our pets mm -hmm. um, for not just to survive, but to actually thrive uh, is a newer thing in the, in the, like you were saying, since, oh, did you say 20, 20, 2009, 2010, um, when Answers was created, it's, it's relatively new for yeah. us, a new idea for us in our so society. Um, mm. but one that is so important, especially as we're seeing more and more disease in our pets and humans and to how our diet has changed through the generations and how you know our pets diets have changed through, through the generations and and this direct correlation to what we're feeding and then the, you know the effect it's having on our health um so with that in mind you know having a brand like solutions What's kind of the founding principle behind that, I guess, is what I'm getting, getting at. Yeah, sir. No, your question. And and let me just say that Chelsea's amazing and, and her team at, at Hero Spets. Uh, Chelsea's been doing this a long time as well. I, I'm pretty sure she opened Hero Spets in 2007. And um, she has incredible intuition uh, on on the health and well-being of animals and and being able to read that and understand that and understand the science and, and the data and she's done an incredible job at, at summarizing and putting that together uh to help her her own clients and and pet parents understand uh what they're seeing and so you know solutions was was born and and this is in my opinion and you know um for that reason to be that resource so not only offering a product to these these pet parents that uh is going to be advantageous to the health of their pet but offering the whole package in other words the education behind it the principles behind it uh the data uh the research the all of that combined as to why we choose what we're choosing as far as ingredients and and sourcing and supply in this pet food. So it really is, uh, solutions is really a, a, a package deal. It's, it's not just going to the store and pulling a product off the shelf. Um, it's being able to tap into a lot of experienced people who a have the passion, uh, to want to do best and, and continue to evolve to do better, uh, and, and be the experience and knowledge as well, uh, that history to be able to help the pet parents feel confident in the changes or transitions that they're making for their pet. 
Well, that is so important. Um, the education piece is is missing. It's been marketing for so long. How can we market this product better so that the consumer purchases it to feed to their pet or to supplement to their pet? Right. And so that like mindset shift from, okay, this has really wonderful marketing, but this education over here is, is telling me like why this was put together the way it was put together and how it's beneficial to me or my pet. And, um, that I, I, I think, or, you know, just as like a human living today, we're like, we have more access to information than ever before, but also less understanding of how to actually get to real information to educate ourselves yeah. than ever before. And um, so I appreciate that about about the brand, about the company. And I know, um, you know, Chelsea's been doing so many things over over the years and Solutions is just one of the newer pieces yeah. of the, the puzzle. <laughs> and I want to talk more about the products that Solutions has. Um, but before we do that, uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier a couple of little things about AFCO, and I want to talk um, a little bit about being a small brand in a space that is huge. I mean, literal billions of dollars every year, and these companies like, because it's on the top of everybody's head right now, like Purina, who's owned by Nestle, who's who's actually owned by like all these like conglomerate um uh um what are, what are they even called the um uh companies that are just you know that buy and sell and have mm -hmm. stock and all these different like there's it's it's it really uh if you get into the weeds of who owns who it you you kind of dw dwindle everything down to like you know, Vanguard and BlackRock, but, <laughs> but <laughs> right. um, I mean, literal billions and billions of dollars. And then it's such a big undertaking. Like it's, to me, it's bravery to, to create a little, you know, a little space for yourself in such a big, um, arena. And so what, when you, when you talked about AFCO earlier and I've had, and I know he, he's been a big part of, of your and your sister's life, lives as well. Um, Billy's a really good friend, uh, mm -hmm. has been on the podcast many times and he's talked about AFCO and kind of like the insidious nature of yeah. what the pet food industry actually is and what AFCO is actually there for. And um, it's not to figure out the best interest for your pet, but to figure out really breaking it down the way I understand it is like, um, how can we best utilize waste from the human food industry and get that into, you know, to, to get it out of, you know, dumping it, let's put it in our pets. That's kind of what it seems like it boils down to. <laughs> how do you see that? I think you hit the nail on the on the head there, Jessica. That sums it up really well. Is it really is um unfortunately I don't I don't think it started that way, but you know, AFCO's over a hundred years old if if people were learning that I think it started back in like nineteen oh eight. And um I don't think it started with that intention, but unfortunately it's evolved into exactly that. A, a Let's lay the landfill and figure out how we can use all these so-called byproducts from manufacturing, you know, whether it's manufacturing of food, even manufacturing of biodiesel uh, fuels. Unfortunately, those byproducts are now making their way into uh, pet food and pet food ingredients because they don't, if they're going to get, they can put a dollar on them. If they can show any kind of uh, AKA nutritional value, in a product, whether it's, you know, just basically saying proteins in there, but 
you know, it could be very damaged, decimated protein, oxidized fats. As long as they can say this is providing calories and with some degree of nutrition in it, then they can rework that product, recycle it, upcycle it, or however you want to, you know, classify it. But it really is not species appropriate pet food. Should not end up in it, or 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 cattle or livestock feed for that matter. And yeah. uh, even if it doesn't make it directly into as a pet food ingredient, it indirectly makes its way into pet food because it ends up as either poultry or uh, cattle, um, you know, feed that it comes into that. And um, so it is disheartening, but it's sort of the reason why I do. And why I know that Jacqueline and I always felt it was important and Chelsea, I believe, feels the same way is that it's the arena that we have to operate in, right? And like you're saying, it's really designed for the big pet food companies, big ag, big pet food. And, you know, when you're at these meetings, it's it's the writings on the wall. It's very clear to see the root. You know, the scientists and the, the, the group that's from the FDA, CBM, so CBM is the Center for Veterinary Medicine. So you have these regulatory folks that are in the FDA, CBM that attend AFCO, and then you have your industry representatives, right? And so that would be like your, you, you know, the NRA, the National Renders Association, or sense people. Well, rendering is a form of basically taking waste and, and, reinventing it through heating it to you know utmost degrees that you can to uh rework it and and make it usable again into some kind of usable ingredient um you have people like the grain association um uh the national uh, grain association that grows in the obviously they represent the big time uh, archer daniels midland um, Monsanto, which is now Bayer, um, you know, the big soy and corn growers that put the, you know, that do all the high fructose corn syrup and less of thin and that's in every single ultra processed food that you can, you know, find on the shelf. Um, so yeah, it's serious money, it's serious lobbying. Um, and they, these big representatives from these organizations like the Pet Food Institute, KFI, sit at the table. But there is hope, and I, I will let you know, um, I, I don't think a lot of folks know about it. So for us small manufacturers, us little guys, um, there is an association that was formed, um, a very brave woman by the name of Dr. Kathy Alanovi uh, stepped up to the plate for us small manufacturers and put together Next Generation Pet Food Manufacturers Association, call it Next Gen. And that's been in play now, I want to say, at least five to six years. Um, and she got us a seat at the table. Kudos to her at AFCO. Yep. So now we have some representation <laughs> when we were just basically going as observers in the past, attending these meetings. Uh, now we have Dr. Kathy that that since as an at the table as our representative for not only raw food manufacturers, but any fresh food, small food, um, pet food manufacturers that are doing, using, you know, human uh, grade ingredients, you know, not, no, you know, not Kindle manufacturers. These are, uh, you know, the, the, the small ones that you'll see in the independent pet supply stores. Um, so that's good news, and that that developed out of a group of us, and uh, VCU was in that group, and Susan Fixton's in that group, and um, of course Chelsea, myself, and you know Billy would attend, and and these are small pet food manufacturers that um, have a um, real concern for where pet food is going in general, and like I said, it's sort of the the arena that we've been given to operate in. Um, so, uh, we have to manage it as best we could, but we feel that there's serious change that does need to happen, um, for the pet food industry in general to get better. And, and we want to see the whole pet food industry get better because that only helps every pet, right? You know, so, mm -hmm. um, 
although, you know, that pie in the sky, and I think we're a long ways from converting a lot of these uh, big corporate giants to make better food, but um, we're there at the table and we're speaking up and that's a good thing. So really happy and excited to be part of the next gen. If there's any other small manufacturers out there listening, um, check it out at ngpmfa.org. Awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well. Um, that is really good news. And it, it, it does feel like a us versus them situation. Um, and, and trying to bridge that gap is important with also without, you know, losing your morals and ethics and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, um, so hopefully there, there can be something that, you know, progress made right. that the one thing that I was, um, curious about your take on, uh, because I, I have multiple people who, who have brought this up to me in the past and, and it does just from a, a lay person such as myself, um, it seems very like the the standards are very unfair for a, a lack of a better word um the standards that uh guidelines that afco provides that the, the states then mm -hmm. use as, as regulation and i like to try to to be as specific as possible when i'm talking about that because it is very it's a very confusing world that the standards are for kibble manufacturers so when you are producing a fresh food product mm -hmm. like solutions does like some of you know the, the other companies you've mentioned some of the smaller manufacturers it 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 can be really difficult not impossible but difficult to meet those guidelines with fresh food especially considering sources of foods and how animals are raised today and the you know the nutrient values that you know a cow had 200 years ago isn't the same nutrient values that they have today and blah 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 all the things um do you think or is it i don't want to say like just it's not fair it's not fair i don't think it's fair but is there any any hope any way around that any any change that you see i think it might be more difficult to try to get the population to understand that AFCO balance, complete and balanced, isn't what you're looking for on a fresh food product because it's what they know and it's all they know. But at the same time, you could, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, you could feed your pet with fresh food and it not be AFCO complete and balanced and they can still thrive, yes. potentially, possibly. <laughs> No, I think you summed that up pretty well, Jessica. And it, it is confusing. And, and without going into um, a full-blown chemistry lesson and, and laboratory analysis lesson, I'll try to I'll try to to sum it up and and keep it brief. But so to, to start out, a lot of people are confused on what AFCO even is, and and they operate in, for lack of a better term, sort of this suspicious area of regulatory that kind of protects them because if you would as AFCO doesn't regulate pet food okay and in the sense that they're gonna like you know slap an injunction or a fine on you like the FDA so FDA is the regulatory body over pet food per se AFCO is a organization um, that includes FDA individuals, includes agricultural Department of Ag officials from each state, um, includes some veterinarians, um, of course, industry representatives. So it's this consortium of a lot of different folk um, that all have influence in the pet food arena that basically get together and write definitions and rules and regulations that 
each of the individual states then can choose to adopt or not. Okay, so it's really up to uh, the individual states on a state-by-state wide basis, and most of them do adopt it. It's just easier for them to adopt what they call um, the AFTO uh, official publication. The, the OP is what they call it, and each year they write a new uh, or updated official publication, and it may include new definitions. And so, with each pass, so there's two meetings every year that happened in talked about the lobbyists that, that go and and you know our industry goes now uh with next gen and so we're lobbyists ourselves trying to you know lobby for our agenda for the raw pet food agenda and and small uh and fresh pet foods but yeah standards were written uh a long time ago now um and it's actually based on uh, an organization called the national research council and you can look up the National Research Council. And again, they're a board of experts that um, get together and advise and, and publish um, based on data and research, uh, different standards for different things in industry. And in particular, this one is um, nutrient requirements for cats and dogs. The last NRC that was published on that was 2006. So the most updated one we have is 2000. But the data goes back as far as the 40s and 50s that they use as far as um, what they're leaning on to make their um, their standards and their their you know their recommendations for what minimum requirements of nutrients are. And the reason I'm going into the history of this, I know it's a little bit boring, but because I want your audience to understand where this data is coming from. Okay, that that we are all held to. Now, whether we're kibble, cooked, fresh, canned, raw, we're all held to this standard of nutrients, right? For the basic nutrients of dogs. And most of your listeners probably think, well, that's a good thing. And it is a good thing that um, we're not just willy nilly, you know, anything goes out there and that there are, there is research and some data that was collected that does. Uh, show you know the requirements that these animals need to to get by and to live and uh most of your reader or listeners are probably too young to remember the whole touring debacle i think that was even you know back in the 80s maybe and that they realized that they if they weren't going to use fresh food which taurine is naturally in a lot of uh, meat and or organs heart muscle liver so if you're feeding a cat fresh food that contains any kind of meat they're getting foreign, but because of the processing and pet food and um, so many, you know, how it's processed so much and such little meat makes its way into pet food, they actually found out that, um, you know, cats couldn't synthesize taurine like dogs can, and they needed to add it. If they weren't going to have enough fresh meat and organs in there, then they needed to add synthetic taurine. And, you know, unfortunately, that was discovered by, um, you know, cats getting really sick and, and dying and uh with heart heart problems and all kinds of things um so we don't want to we don't want to have to go through that right where we uh find out after the fact that um, dogs and cats are are deficient or, or getting ill because we missed something in our food but um unfortunately that's a byproduct of processing right so if we go back and just use our common sense on um, general observation of what these animals are and what You're they are finding it common sense, <laughs> right? <laughs> what the counterpart, their the wild counterparts are eating in the wild, right? If we just step out of our little laboratory for five minutes and go into nature and observe what a wild cat and a wild dog would be eating, we can see that they, um, are surviving and thriving in a lot of areas on, um, you know, what Mother Nature has provided. And what Mother Nature is providing them is, you know, wild prey, they're scavenging, they're, you know, and nobody's adding synthetic chlorine to their diet, and nobody's adding copper and zinc and other mineral. You know, they are, they are foraging and, and they are also uh, scavenging, but mostly, you know, as carnivores, they're catching prey. And that's providing everything that they eat. So we have to remember that, right? That 
um, you know, we have come a long way in, in the science of nutrition, but we still have a long way to go in really understanding. And so when, in my opinion, as a food scientist and somebody who uh, has been through food analysis classes, actually, I worked in a food analysis lab, set it up. I understand also the limitations of testing food. So a lot of people don't understand, even in ultra processed foods and synthetic foods, when you are able to standardize something, it's still very difficult and you're still dealing with food that's got to have variation. Now when you go back and you do this in real food, when I say real food, you know, non-synthetic food, but food that is provided in its whole natural form. They cut a beef heart, for instance, follows because that's one of the ingredients we use, right? So you take a beef heart and you can test that beef heart um, from, you know, one, one set of, you know, a cow over here and, you know, and it's going to give you a rating of, you know, amino acids and, of course, the protein and, you know, the uh, B vitamins, you know, your fat-soluble vitamins, you're going to get this weight, right? You're going to test another beef heart over here that you took from this rant. And if they did you another rate. But nonetheless, the basic ingredients or the basic nutrients, they're there, but they're going, they are going to vary. Mm -hmm. So when AFCO puts together this nutrient profile, and it says, well, you need 20 milligrams of zinc per kilogram, and you need 2.5 mags of copper per kilogram, and these are the minimums. You have to remember that, A, this was first, these this data that they're pulling from is from laboratory analysis on isolated, fractionated, very purified ingredients and food. Okay, so when I say that, fractionated, isolated, that means this is food that was put together in a lab or um, in a manufacturing facility that was um, very specific, um, probably not all whole foods. There might have been some real you know, real lean ingredients and things like that in there. But for the most part, you know, a lot of synthetics and things like that. And then they would test them, you know, on these animals. So it's still very limited information in so much that if you want to feed your pet non-processed food, whole food ingredients that are whole from these animals, like a beef liver or like a, a, a raw meaty bone, or a whole sardine, you know, you you can't standardize those foods. So the best I can sit here and tell you as a food chemist and a, and a nutritionist, I can say, you know, Jessica, I know there's plenty of data that shows sardines are great, great ripoff, you know, um, resource for your vitamin A, your vitamin D, and your omegas. We know it's in, we know every sardine is going to have some omega-3 fatty you know, some more than other, but it, it's going to be in there. You, if you give your dog a sardine, you want providing omega-3 fatty acid. That's, can I tell you how much in each sardine every time? No, I can't. But I can tell you it's going to be a good source, and it's going to be a good, clean source of it. And I can tell you there's going to be vitamin D in there. Can I tell you, Jessica, that you're going to get 500 IUs, international units, okay, per kilogram, in every two sardines that you feed your dog, I can't. But I can assure you that every time it is going to provide vitamin D for your dog. So you see where we don't even say So when you are held to a standard that of minimum, you know, requirement, and they do say these are minimums. So you know they they expect you to say you know you got to hit these minimums. And I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater here. This is all good information that has evolved over the years and it gives us a good baseline. And I will say as somebody who has done laboratory analysis and understands um, a lot of methodologies on our capabilities for measuring these, the macronutrients are pretty, are going to be pretty accurate. And when I say macronutrients, that's your protein, that's your fat, your moisture, your ash. We do have methodologies and laboratory instruments that are pretty keen on getting that pretty close, in my opinion. The further you get down and you try to get to actual amino acid content, actual um, micronutrients, trace elements that are very, very small in there, 
and also very dependent on other minerals that they would either interact with or chelate with. You got to remember when you go to measure these things in a laboratory, you have to isolate them first to measure them. And when you do that, there is a lot of assumptions and limitations that you have to um, assume in your methodology that are going to happen that are, are never going to give you 100% accuracy. So it is an estimate. You can get, you know, you can try to get close, um, but it's not perfect. So when you're taking fresh food and you're basically saying, you know, jam this square peg into this round hole and make it work. You know, it's it's not going to all the time. So getting back to your, you know, can we as fresh food manufacturers offer a complete and balanced diet that's not going to actually fit into that afro-nutrient profile every single time? In my opinion, professional opinion, the answer is yes. We can get complete and balanced for these animals. Oh, you know, it, within this variation that as you eat over time, it is not going to create deficiencies or toxicities, right? But in that one standardized, you know, profile that's sitting in the AFCO OP, you know, there's many times you're going to deviate from that. And so then you're, you know, you're, because you're not using pre-mixed vitamins, you're not using these synthetic vitamins, you can't standardize. And when you can't standardize, you can't guarantee, okay? And so we have to list these guaranteed analysis. Now, the macronutrients, I will admit, like I said, are pretty, you, you can get really close on this. So I know when I formulate or, or you know, a, a diet that you're, you're, if you want, you know, 14% protein and you want that your minimum, you know, you, you, can, you can formulate to get to 14% minimum protein. However, if you want to get, for instance, to, you know, 200 parts per million of manganese, <laughs> you know, that's going to be a little bit trickier when you're not using synthetic, when you're depending on, you know, I'm going to throw in some of this for my manganese or some of that. And so that's where um, it does work against the small food and fresh food, whole food manufacturer um, when you work with um, profiles like that. So they do give you an alternative, uh, and, I, and I'll go into that. And the alternative is to do a feeding trial. I said, okay, if you're not hitting these nutrient profiles in AFCO, well, we'll give you another way on your label to say this is complete and balanced, and we offer uh, a protopaw for a, a feeding trial. Now, if you want to use the typical um, captive dog laboratory uh, analysis, which is, I believe, in Nebraska, there's, a, there's a, a beagle colony lab that does most of the feeding trials for the big guys. Um, it's $25,000, uh, not something I want to support because these beagles are in captivity. They, they don't get out much. They um, are kept in kennels pretty much all their lives and then used for these types of feeding trials. So you can go and hire um, a professional laboratory that has, excuse me, these beagle colonies, uh, which most of us that are in the small pet food manufacturing world really don't <laughs> want to get behind. Um, so then that leaves you with um, sort of the informal trials that we kind of have to depend on uh, volunteers and um, maybe a, a a, a trusted breeder that you may know to so it's eight dogs that you have to start with uh eight eight in a, in the control group eight in your test group it's um 26 weeks which is six months i think you should actually go a year i don't even think six months is long enough to really um understand the complete um diet you know for the dogs that they wouldn't be getting deficiencies or things wouldn't be creeping up but it is six months and um Two dogs can drop out from each group, so you got to end up with six finishing in each group. And it's very basic measurements that they um, require, and that's another way that you can um, prove that you know you're hitting everything you need you need to hit. But because of such an expense, we're looking at you know 
twenty to thirty thousand dollars to really carry out something like that. Unfortunately, a lot of these small pet food manufacturers just don't have that kind of research dollar to upfront to do that right away. Right. Yeah. So, so with solutions, how how do they fit in? How does because it is a fresh food company. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yes. So um, Chelsea uses a uh, software product called the Animal Diet Formulator. And it's a really keen piece of software. Uh, Steve Brown, Susan Recker, and Barbara Royale are the, the geniuses behind that. And it's a really good tool because Steve Brown is is a pioneer in uh, raw food feeding. He's been around forever, great guy. And he's collected a lot of data over the years. He like He's a data person too, loves to analyze the data, loves to collect that. And so he's put together a very useful um, software program. You can purchase it as um, an individual too. You don't have to be a manufacturer. If you're a DIYer and you want you know, you want a, a good base to work off to see that you're hitting your numbers, um, look at the animal diet formulator. So that's what we use. Um, it's a great way to know that, um, you know, again, either estimates, this is, you know, the best you can get. But we are hitting our numbers uh, with fresh foods. We yeah. dial in to the point where we're, we're hitting the numbers with fresh food. And, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's expensive. We use the top quality, um, top of the top of the top in the supply chain to reach those numbers. And, um, you know, it, it does, but you do get what you pay for in that situation. And we are able to do a completely 100% raw food diet with whole, fresh, fermented ingredients. And fermentation helps in getting those numbers because those little bacteria work on the food and they can actually produce more B vitamins. They can produce enzymes and things that help with bioavailability, digestibility. So, uh, and then we'll get into fermentation here and then too. <laughs> yes, I do want to talk about fermentation um, and learn some some fun things hopefully about fermentation from you. But I, I just wanted to interject that, um, so I use the animal diet formulator and when you were talking about manganese, I was triggered. <laughs> <laughs> I was so triggered. <laughs> I'm telling you that that little bugger is uh -huh. every single time. Ginger's a good source of Ginger. Ginger's a good source of manganese. Yeah. Actually yes, nice. I have used that. Actually, I I created some some recipes for Dr. Katie Woodley's community, and that's what I I ended up with oh. ginger. Um and. I'm, but I'm telling, yes, especially with dogs that have a lot of sensitivities and I'm just limited in what I can use. I'm like, oh, that man like every time that's what I wind up with. I'm like, how am I going to get manganese in this? That was the mind when I was thinking of struggling to get it all right. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, fermentation. My dog, who, so I adopted her at two and a half years. She was pulled out of Mexico. I know she only ate kibble for the first two and a half years of her life, but. From the day I adopted her on, she only ate a raw food diet, a uh, commercially available raw food diet. Immediately when I switched her food, and I don't even remember the brand, it was, doesn't matter what the brand was. It's a good, good brand. There's nothing wrong with the brand, but um, her ears, red, inflamed, itchy, immediately. And I'm like, well, crap. What the hell? What do I do? And this was still pretty early on for me. Um, not in the idea of feeding fresh food. I had been feeding fresh food, but as far as like understanding nutrition and what, you know, what's actually going on in my dog's body and why they need different things. And so for whatever reason, my brain, you know, got my light, I got this light bulb and was like, ah, I'm going to go buy some raw goat's milk. So I did that. And literally within 24 hours, her ears calmed down. So, um, I, you know, raw goat's milk has been a staple of her diet ever since, but I know that going from that fermented food product to a non-fermented food product caused something in her body to say, no, thank you. 
And I don't, I still to this day don't really know why, because she does really well with, with non-fermented foods now. I don't, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I do now, now that mm-hmm. she's getting older, I feed her, um, fermented beets for digestive enzymes but for most most of the past few years she hasn't really had anything fermented but um i know that goat's milk has been helping her and so i don't really understand what what happened happened. um i'm not a food scientist like you (laughs) but i know that that something about that fermented food Mm -hmm. um was obviously really beneficial and her body didn't like it when i took it away Mm -hmm. So fermentation is a big part of what Solutions does. And I would love to just hear from you, learn from you a little bit about why that is, why fermentation can be so beneficial for so many people and animals. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, with my background being in cheese and, and dairy cultures, I, you know, early on in my career had that introduction to what these bacteria are capable of and and how they evolve and how we evolve with them to really be part of our food system and be in our food so it's it's something that unfortunately in the western diet when with the advent of the industrial revolution and we started to process food more and more we you know continuously degraded the level of live microorganisms and beneficial bacteria in our food um unfortunately you know as a trade-off for attacking pathogens which you know would be making people sick we we couldn't find that happy medium and when they, there's so much history to fermentation and if you dive into it the you know, um indigenous people and and native cultures have been using it for millennia to preserve food so it has such a long history of you know, we can be so confident in it because it does have such a long history of proving itself. Um, but what a lot of people don't understand that in addition to being sort of a food preservation technique, it actually helps us assimilate food and actually kind of pre-digest food for for us and our companion animals. And that's what makes it that's what I don't understand why more manufacturers aren't using it. I really don't. I mean, there's nothing proprietary about it. Uh, there's nothing patented on fermentation. This is something that's used in the food industry and has been for many, many, many years and has a, a good track record. So I, Jacqueline and I always said that to each other. We're like, why aren't more people doing this? It's really not rocket science. It's pretty easy to do, and there's so much literature on it. If you go looking for it, um, it's out there, and 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 you guys can do this at home so easily. And now with the advent of the internet and and things like Etsy, and you know you can get your kabucha mother on Etsy, you can get your kefir grains on Etsy if you want to start. You know, there's you can just like they shared in the old days with the friendship bread, and you know if your neighbor would pass you their starter culture a friendship bread which is basically you know like a sourdough culture and you would pass that on that now with the advent of the internet i was able to get uh kefir grains uh for my own home kefir from poland from a place in poland i thought it was really cool you know so yeah. anyway going back to that the fermentation just to me is is so conducive to raw pet food because a, we're trying to keep it raw, right? I mean, that, as a commercial manufacturer who, who it has to play in the commercial arena of regulatory, to me, it made so much sense to, because um, we don't want to kill step, because a kill step pretty much neutralizes that, the benefits of being raw, right? You really, they're kind of an oxymoron. If you do a kill step, you're processing the food to the point where it's really not raw anymore. So how do we keep it raw and how do we deliver it safely, right? How do we take it through the supply chain knowing that um, pathogen not that grow? So we load it up with beneficial microorganisms. What's the easiest way to load up your recipe with beneficial microorganisms? Fermented foods, right? Fermented ingredients. So ferment your vegetables, um, your cultured milks. Um, you know, all of these different types of ingredients that are fermented, uh, we ferment our ginger, um, we ferment cod liver, 
cod livers, you know, a lot of people don't realize that you actually can ferment protein type foods. I mean, yes, the, the most, the, the, the most conducive foods for fermentation are those high in starches and sugars because that's what the bacteria like best. But there's many, um, bacteria that, uh, can absolutely convert protein to sugars for themselves and, uh, ferment things like eggs and, and, uh, cod livers and things like that. So you can ferment those types of foods. A lot of people don't realize that. And what those microorganisms do is they're, you know, they're little, um, kind of their own little processing factories. You know, they're, cha they're working on those ingredients, uh, working on those nutrients in that food. And, and the benefits of it is it actually makes it more viral available and often better for us to consume it so it actually can enhance the food and make it easier and so that's why these dogs who struggle so much so so digestion a lot of people don't realize is uh, a super high metabolic load on your body in other words like that's where we spend some of the most of our calories and our energy on digesting our food and as, as well as our companion animals. So these carnivores, you know, they, if they're fed a, a non-species appropriate diet, like most kibbles are, their organs and their body are working overtime to pull any kind of available nutrients out of that stuff to, you know, to assist in repair and growth and healing and immune support and all of that. So when you switch an animal to foods that are essentially pre-digested for them, because bacteria has already worked on it and is delivering a lot of digestive enzymes, also, you know, they're also seeding the gut with good bacteria. Um, and then you're, you know, feeding whole foods on top of that, which adds is, um, incredibly um, less taxing on the body for them. So that means that if you, if digestion goes from here down here in your energy needs, look how much now that that animal can spend on healing and repairing the body and getting into remission. So that's why we see animals do so much better um, when they go on um raw foods and particularly fermented foods and goat milk. Goat milk is is definitely at the top of the list for because it is a reproductive food, it's what grows mammal right? Any mammal starts its life with raw milk, right? No matter what mammalian species you are, you're starting your life with raw milk. So Mother Nature had to make it perfect, right? Mm -hmm. If it's from a healthy animal, I'll do that caveat. If you're you you're not gonna get my motto is you're not going to get healthy food from a sick animal, right? So if you are pulling food from sick animals, and that's why back at the, in the turn of the century when they started pasteurizing milk, the cows were sick. The cows were very sick. Uh, almond, distillery, dairy, and things before we went. And that's why people were getting tuberculosis. And then the milk was a vehicle for disease and not a vehicle for health. So the animal has to be properly fed and healthy and low stress environment. And when you have all those things, then you get a perfect food from milk. And then fermentation, like I said, just have that extra, um, not only food safe. So when you have beneficial bacteria that you have in the particularly lactic acid bacteria, uh, culturing a food, um, you know, there's only so much um, nutrients and space available in that particular, uh, you know, you can look at it as a petri dish or however. So if you're flooding that with the beneficial bacteria that that fermentation is responsible for, and a pathogen happens to be already in there or or finds its way in there, it can't compete. It simply just can't compete. It's it's I'm, I'm, you know try to liken it to like, I guess, if, you know, if you're in a, a giant ballroom, right. And, and yeah, it, it, it's already filled to the brim with people. Um, you know, you're just, there's only so many more you can fit in, right. Well, that's kind of what it is in food as well. And so, um, so the key components when you're using fermentation, uh, to combat pathogens is you've got to start with clean food. So the, the way it works best is you're, you know, you can't start with a heavily contaminated environment. So 
you're not going to be good if, if you're starting with roadkill or something's boiled already or something putrid, you're not going to be able to ferment that and make a good food out of it. So, you know, you definitely have to start with fresh, clean food. Um, and then that you've got the perfect medium there where you can inoculate that with your fermented ingredients or your starter cultures. And then it's got all the room to grow and have a happy environment. And then out to hens just can't compete. So it's a great way to, in my opinion, offer raw foods that are really, you know, minimally processed and hardly at all. Um, you can keep the foods frozen. Um, it, it's conducive to temperature abuse because if the meat warms up, um, you're still, you you know, we stack the deck is what we did. And we stack the deck in favor of the beneficial microorganisms. And so they're already in the lead and you warm up the food and they're just going to take off even more. Um, so that's what's so great about this intervention method. I love that. And I appreciate the explanation. Um, it, it's sometimes I, I wonder if I'm the only one that just like, am I dense and I don't get it? <laughs> But um, I think it's because I just growing up, I wasn't exposed to a lot of different foods, certainly not fermented foods. And so even today, like I you know, people, my friends make fun of me all the time because I, I have a child's palate and I'm like, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> Sounds like right? my husband thinks the same way. <laughs> um, but, you know, fortunately, our our, our pets are, are generally a lot more forgiving. Unless we're talking about cats, they're not very forgiving. But um, <laughs> it's a whole other other thing. And I I don't want to um, short change any of the products that Solutions is offering because I know that it is more than just a raw pet food company. Um, I know that there are also a lot of different herbal blends. That these are the kind of supplements I can get behind. Um, I know, uh, you know, I I have education and, and veterinarians that I'm fortunate to get to work with because of what I do and a lot of um, support and knowledge because of that. And there are so many supplements on the market. It's It's not a very regulated place to be, um, whether it's human or, or pet supplements. And um so when we look at like actual food what can what can when we look at nature and what does nature give us for whatever it is we're needing that that's the kind of product that i like to get behind and that i like to recommend to people to research and look at and so i know there are lots of different like herbal blends that she's doing as well um do you want to add anything to that (laughs) Well, uh, I'll just add that, again, Chelsea is um, incredibly intelligent and she's done her homework and she has uh, an incredible skill for blending herbs. She's a self-taught herbalist. She knows her stuff uh, when it comes to uh, blending these herbs and what to mix with what. Um, I learned a lot from her because I I'm not an herbalist. Um, that's that's not my forte. So, but I'm a huge fan of it as far as using. Um, homeopathy and herbs and, um, you know, whether they're Chinese herbs or Western herbs as a means of medicinal um, medicine. Yeah, absolutely. That would be my choice. So um, I'll give you an example. So Chelsea has a blend in her um, herb toolkit called Allergy, or I'm sorry, yeah, Allergies. And um, that's an incredible blend uh, for environmental allergies. She also has one called Immune. And I use that one on my, I got an actual um, uh, anecdotal information on that because I use that on my own dog. Um, I'm pretty sure that she came down with that mystery respiratory illness that was going around. I have have two Malamutes and um, my younger female, she's a four. And this was about three or four months ago now and at the end of winter. And she presented one morning with this awful cough, like just sounded like a a sea lion and um i was really worried i was like wow i i you know didn't expect them them pretty healthy dogs you know and um, i didn't expect her to come down with it but she had this cough and she was having these coughing fits like every two hours so immediately i decided to start her on immune the immune blend and then i also fasted her on our um 
chicken jiggles and our fish jiggles. So I reduced her food to maybe a third of what she normally got uh, and just fed her one little meat meal a day and gave her basically three or four portions, portion sizes throughout the day of the uh, jiggles. And I put the immune blend in there. And I called my vet, Dr. Terry Sue. She's here in Eugene, a fabulous holistic vet. Um, she uses the solutions products quite a bit to uh, address the health conditions in her clients. And she's had very good success. So I told her what I was going to do. And she said, all right, let's give it three days. And, and if Suki, if her cough doesn't clear three days, I want to see her. I'm, this was on a Friday. And she said, you know, call me back on Monday and we'll get her in. And um, so I started Friday morning. And by Sunday evening, she was clear. Um, she was clear of it. And no residual cough. Like it, Friday, her fits started to reduce. And then by Saturday, a little bit more. And um i called terry sue back on monday i said she's good like i don't know if you need to see her this is what i did and it was two doses of the immune one in the morning one in the evening in in the uh bone broth jiggles basically and then just you know pretty much reduced her food to very small amounts so that her body can rest and and just use the uh the bone broth and and work like a charm mm. Everything happens on Friday, doesn't it? <laughs> it seems that way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, um, uh, thank you so much for everything um, that you gave us today. It's so incredibly informative. And I know that we're blessed to be able to even have these thoughts and these conversations on doing better for our pets. I don't want to take that for granted um, because I know a lot of people aren't necessarily in that position yet to where they can start thinking further right. out and beyond and about what they're putting in the bowl. But I like to get these conversations going to to put ideas in people's minds, to give them something to look for, to to strive towards goals to have. Um and also, you know, we we can't expect people to do better without the education. Right, without Absolutely. knowing that there is better to be done. I was, so, you know, I'm the perfect example of that as far as I came out of school with a graduate degree in nutrition and food science. Guess what I said? Kettle. For many years. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, don't beat yourself up, guys. It's, it, this is, and don't beat your vet up because veterinarians don't get this in school either. Um, I said I was I was trained very conventionally, and although I I'm blessed to have my education, and it's gotten me to where I I am today for sure, understanding that that basics of biochemistry and everything, I can apply. But I really didn't have my epiphany, Jessica, till that year, 2009, and I was introduced to Western A Price Organization and learning about traditional foods and and then the science behind traditional foods and why they work. And that's where my science background was really helpful to me, but I didn't come out with this knowledge. So yes, the education is extremely important. I had to be educated on this stuff, just like everybody else. Re-educated, right? That's how I see it. Yeah, so I have re-educated on it, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, but right. So knowing better allows you to be able to do better. So I, I just appreciate you and the work you do and, um, you know, working with Chelsea to bring products like this to the market for pet parents. Um, where can people find solutions, pet products, and how can they get more information and education from the brand? Yes, thank you. Yeah, the website is a plethora of information. So uh, it has a great feeding calculator on it. It has blogs. It has publications, resources at Solutions Pet Products with an S dot com. Um, very easy to, to find us. You can um, look at our collaborators, some of the holistic bets that we work with. And um, like I said, if if it uh, if it's something you have a burning question about, um, Chelsea and I will often write blogs on it. Um, there's uh, a blog available about um, fermented foods containing histamine and, uh, you know, if I should feed that to my pet that might have mast cell cancer, we address those things. 
Oh, um, you know, we, uh, pancreatitis and, you know, is your, is a whole food diet with, you know, a substantial amount of fat still appropriate for my dog or pancreatitis? We address those things. Um, because they're all valid questions that, you know, oftentimes you get from your veterinarian of why they feel you shouldn't feed this type of diet. And, um, this isn't things that we're not exposed to that we don't understand. We, we dive right into them and we work with the holistic vets that understand this to, um, get you the, you know, get you the solutions you need, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here and helping to educate more pet parents. Um, just appreciate you. Thank you so appreciate much. Appreciate you too. Thank you. Yeah. You know, keep it going. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos in my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside.